right, good morning. You had a good weekend. Uh, so we are a week out from our next exam. So if in August I would have realized that next Tuesday was election day, I probably would have chosen a different day for an exam, but I don't like to move the exam date when I've already announced it. So we're gonna keep our exam on Tuesday. Uh, I've had a couple people say, well, I have to go home to vote and I want you to vote, um, but I do want you to take the exam in person if at all possible. So if that means you come in on Monday and take the exam, that's great. If that means uh, you come in Tuesday afternoon and take the exam, that's great. Um, I'd rather do it either Monday or Tuesday, but uh, talk to me if the voting is, you know, messing you up with taking that in person. So um, as with other exams, I need you to email me and let me know if you are quarantined and can't take it in person. Uh, I know of only a couple of you right now. So uh, again, I want most of you to be taking this exam three in person. Uh, looking ahead, we're going to squeeze in exam four before Thanksgiving. It's a Tuesday before break, which I know is kind of painful. Same thing. If you're planning on going home that whole week, you want to take it the Friday before. That's fine. If you want to take it the Monday before, I can work with you. But I want to try to avoid giving you know half the class the exam by respondents. Okay. So just kind of be thinking ahead there. Uh, and hopefully that will make it less painful. All right, so remember you're, you only have three chapters of homework that's due exam time a week from today. Okay, so we have uh, been in chapter 10 with the antibiotics. We talked about some general things with antibiotics, how they're administered, uh, how we test the sensitivity of them. We talked about allergic reactions a little bit, the toxicity issues, that sort of thing. Uh, I have one more specific drug that I wanna talk about. I think we've had about like 14 or 15 drugs. Uh, we're gonna go back to our concept map after we go through our sulfur drugs. So one more drug to talk about. So before we talk a little bit about resistance, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. All right, so the sulfa drugs, this is a pretty big group. Uh, there's a lot of different sulfonamide drugs. Uh, they all have this uh, sulfonamide functional group. Okay, so uh, that's what they have in common. And they target folic acid biosynthesis. So that's a metabolic pathway that we don't have. We, get, we need folic acid for ourselves as well in order to make DNA and RNA. Uh, bacteria need it, they have to make their own. All right, we get ours from our diet, bacteria have to make their own. So that's what makes the drug selectively toxic. Okay, and um, we often administer a sulfa drug with a drug called trimethoprim at the same time because they, they work together to uh, stop enzymes in this biosynthetic pathway. So uh, this diagram is a little bit more specific than what's really necessary for this course, but basically you've got some sub substrate, one of them is PABA or para-aminobenzoic acid, uh, the sulfonamides inhibit the first enzyme in the pathway, and I don't have that name of that enzyme memorized, but inhibits that enzyme. Uh, trimethoprim drugs actually inhibit, there's another enzyme here, of course, inhibit the third enzyme in the pathway. So it's kind of a one-two punch. It makes sense to use those drugs together uh, just to kind of make sure that that synthesis is halted. And of course, that's going to eventually kill the organism. This tetrahydrofolic acid, that's basically the same thing as folic acid. Okay, uh, and this, when we use those two drugs together, uh, SX, that stands for sulfamethoxazole, uh, and T for trimethoprim. So that's one of the drugs that we used in lab for our Kirby Bauer test. You might recognize SXT. Uh, the trade name, so the company that manufactures SXT calls it Bactrim. 
Okay, so I know it's confusing to have two different names for the same thing, uh, but uh, you, that, may, that name may be a little bit more familiar to you, um, Bactrim. All right, so here's the uh, graphic from your book, which kind of is kind of helpful uh, in a little different way from that first diagram. So here's the structure up here of the substrate of that metabolic reaction, Haba. Okay, and then if you look at some different sulfa drugs, their structure, you'll see that it has that same, you know, benzoic or sorry, um, benzene ring in common there. So it's very structurally similar. All of the different sulfa drugs, they have some different side chains and things, uh, but they're all structurally similar to that substrate. So actually they work, uh, they are competitive inhibitors. So if we label uh, this diagram here, here's um, the enzyme working with normal substrate. Okay, so here's, Here's the enzyme. And again, we're not going to worry about what that enzyme is. Uh, this is the normal substrate, paraminobenzoic acid. And eventually, when that substrate binds into the active site, of course, there's a couple of other steps there. But eventually, you get folic acid, which again is necessary to make DNA and RNA. OK. Now, if uh, you have a sulfa drug, that's coming in for the substrate, um, that para amino benzoic acid can't enter the active site. All right, so you've got here um, sulfonilamide instead. That's this drug up here. And so we don't get folic acid. <laughs> All right, so again, this is an example of competitive inhibition. We have the drug binding to the enzyme instead of the substrate, and so we don't get the products that we would normally have. Uh, okay. So these are synthetic drugs. We talked about the, oh, you want me to go back a second? Okay, all right. So we talked a little bit about sulfa drugs before and we are uh, talking about the history of antibiotics. Uh, they are synthetic. Uh, Gerard Doma first developed them in the early 1930s. Uh, he was working at uh, Bayer Chemical Company and just kind of working through lots and lots of different drugs, trying to find one that was effective against streptococcal infections in mice. Uh, finally found one and um, they were really miracle drugs at the time. Uh, they only worked against strept streptococcus, uh, but you know, there was things like, you know, strep throat, scarlet fever. It was very effective against, um, credited with saving the life of Winston Churchill in the 1930s. So uh, saved lots of lives, even though they were narrow spectrum. They're more broad spectrum today as we've, you know, synthetically monkeyed with side chains. We've, we've been able to get them to work on lots of other organisms. We don't use them as much today uh, because we found a lot of drugs that are less toxic. So sulfa drugs tend to be kind of hard on the kidneys. Uh, you know, I have written here high incidence of allergies and I looked that up and it's actually about 3% of people are uh, allergic to sulfa drugs. So um, probably not as high as penicillin. Remember that number that I gave you for penicillin, I said about 10% of us are allergic. Uh, so I, I looked into that a little bit more carefully and 10% of us say we're allergic because you know we had a rash or something in our childhood, but probably it's more like 1% of us that have a really serious penicillin allergy. So. Uh, that, that number might be inflated a little bit, but again, because of the risk of having some worse you know, reaction, doctors don't, don't mess with that. So what do we use sulfa drugs for? 
Usually we don't use them unless something else has been tried first. Uh, there are a few infections. There's some acne, acne medications, um, urinary tract infections, some protozoan infections where they seem to be more commonly used. Uh, they're commonly used in vet medicine as well because they're very cheap. Okay, questions about sulfa drugs. All right, so if you have that concept map that we started last time, I've cheated a little bit and typed in some of my other, our other mechanisms of action. And um, so these are all the drugs that we wrote in last time. We had a bunch of beta lactams. We had a few other drugs that are also cell wall inhibitors that are not beta lactams, the vancomycin, bacitracin, and isoniazid. Um, so I think this is helpful to kind of just kind of keep in your mind the mechanisms of action of the drugs. Uh, we had a lot of protein synthesis inhibitors, uh, aminoglycosides. Uh, we're a big class of uh, protein synth synthesis inhibitors. Uh, the example of the aminoglycoside that we used was streptomycin. Uh, the first drug that was effective against tuberculosis. Uh, and then let's see, we talked about uh, my, I'm going to draw on another line here, tetracyclines. Okay. Also targeting, targeting that small subunit of the ribosome. Uh, we didn't talk about any specific tetracyclines. Uh, doxycycline is a tetracycline that sometimes I talk about that's uh, commonly prescribed for pneumonia, but we didn't talk about that. Um, we've got the, ignore this red line here, uh, the macrolides. Okay, and those are drugs that target the large subunit of the ribosome. And the example that we gave was azithromycin. So the aminoglycosides and the titanes target the small subunit of the ribosome and uh, the macrolides target the large subunit. Okay, uh, yeah, some of my lines here got mixed up. Nucleic acid inhibitors, I'm running out of room here a little bit. Uh, the ones that target the DNA gyrase, so inhibits, uh, replication of DNA. Those were the quinolins and the fluoroquinolins. Got room there, sorry. Okay. All right, I, I mentioned a couple examples of quinolins uh, and fluoroquinolins, but uh, we didn't talk about any of them like real specifically. Uh, so I won't write those in here. Uh, rifampin is our RNA polymerase inhibitor, or rifampicin. That drug is sometimes called rifampicin, same thing. All right, our cell membrane inhibitor, we finished with that one last time, polymyxin. All right, they um, disrupt cell membrane of host cells. And then we finished up with our sulfur drugs today. Uh, inhibiting folic acid synthesis. Okay. So I can I can post a little neater copy of that later if, if that's helpful. But I think it is helpful to write it out yourself. It's a good way to study for the exam, and uh, you know there'll be a lot of questions that you'll need to know how those particular drugs work. So. And have it straight in your head. Well, which ones are beta lactans? They all work the same way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. So, uh, oh, and I just I, I came across this figure, and I thought, oh, we talk about a lot of these drugs. This this might be kind of helpful. So I just threw this up here. Uh, I crossed out a couple of the ones that that we didn't really talk about in class. This is. Not all the ones that we talked about, but I just thought that may be helpful. 
All right, so our discussion of antibiotics would be lacking if we didn't talk a little bit about antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is a huge issue that's actually, you know, up until this year, it was in the news quite a bit. Um, if you have a infection uh, with an antibiotic resistant organism that's, we're getting pretty close to be considered an, a, uh, uh, a medical emergency. Um, it's, it's a huge problem because we're not developing more and more antibiotics all the time. It's not economically feasible for uh, pharmaceutical companies to be doing that. Um, the new antibiotics that we do uh, come up with are often too toxic to be used generally. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem that's not gonna go away anytime soon. So we want to explore a little bit, how has this happened? How do bacteria gain the ability to survive in the presence of antibiotics? Well, thinking about it in a kind of a simplistic way, uh, it, this diagram may be helpful. So we have bacteria that are not resistant to antibiotics. That's still the case for most bacteria. Um, if there happens to be some kind of mutation, say, to a couple of cells in a population that makes them resistant to antibiotics, uh, they typically would be outcompeted by other bacteria. So uh, it would only help them if they happen to be in the presence of antibiotics. So um, in the presence of drugs, though, uh, those organisms that have that mutation would survive, and of course, the other non-resistant organisms wouldn't, and give the, the organisms uh, the chance to proliferate that did have the mutation. Okay. So the idea here is that resistance follows selective pressure. Okay, that selective pressure is going to especially be uh, present in hospitals where most patients that are you know, in hospitals are on antibiotics. They give them before surgery, they give them after surgery. Um, that's in medical settings, that's where the selective pressure exists. So uh, what's the answer to that? We'll talk about some ways that we can hopefully cut down on resistance, but really the answer is use antibiotics as little as possible. Take away that selective pressure and then hopefully we can save them so when it's really important to use them. Uh, so just some examples of some, uh, you know, we've named some strains of organisms that are antibiotic resistant. We talked about MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, not only resistant to methicillin, but all the beta lactams and lots of the commonly used antibiotics uh, vancomycin, vancomycin resistant enterococci. Uh, if you're in lab, you use enterococcus this week. It's an organism that's very, very closely related to streptococcus, which you might have more likely to hear of. Uh, vancomycin is usually an antibiotic that's kind of a last resort antibiotic. So we've got organisms that are resistant to that now. Uh, lots of resistance in tuberculosis. That's a huge problem. Uh, gonorrhea, uh, we're having a lot of trouble with resistance there. So it's hard to find examples of organisms that, or infections that we're not having problems with antibiotic resistance. So what kind of things contribute to resistance? Like I said before, uh, selective pressure, uh, just natural selection, bacteria, uh, like they, they divide, they reproduce really quickly. So the chances that, you know, a mutation uh, is going to be beneficial is not very good, but because they do reproduce so rapidly, uh, that's the way that happens. So especially in healthcare settings, um, I think that we're getting a lot better at, you know, educating not only a general population, but, but doctors certainly as well to only use antibiotics when they're necessary. Um, but certainly doctors are under a lot of pressure uh, to heal their patients or, hey, maybe I'll just try this, even though it probably won't work, I'm gonna try it anyway. Or, you know, patients demanding something, you know, my kid is cranky, you need to give him something. 
uh, you know, even if it's not appropriate. They're, they've been drastically overused in agricultural settings. So we discovered sometime in the 1960s or 1970s that when you gave uh, livestock antibiotics prophylactically, even when they weren't sick, you put it in their feed uh, that made them grow faster. Okay, so that increased their profits. So pretty soon, you know, everybody was putting antibiotics in their feed and that really went unregulated for a long time. Uh, so um, I think I mentioned that before when I talked about tetracycline, that's an antibiotic that's been put in chicken feed for decades and now pretty much all sal salmonella that's, that's normally present in chickens is all resistant to tetracycline. So we definitely think that there might be a link there and we're trying to cut down on that practice. But again, when it increases profits for farmers then it's, it's a tough battle, it's not an easy question to do. Um, and just worldwide, of course, in this country, it's a little harder to come across antibiotics because you have to go to the doctor, you have to get prescribed. But in other countries, you can buy antibiotics at the drugstore, just off the shelf. So people take the wrong dosage. Uh, they don't take enough to actually, um, you know, totally wipe out the organism. And then there's more like a chance, more likely that they'll, the organism will mutate a little bit and be harder to kill. All right, so what are some things that we can do to hopefully decrease the chances that bacteria will become resistant? Uh, you can take your full prescription. Now, of course, the exception to that is that you have some crazy, crazy side effect. Uh, call your doctor and they may tell you to stop it. Okay, if you have some allergic reaction, obviously don't keep taking it. But um, take your full prescription and encourage the people you know to take their full, full prescription. My dad is the worst offender of this. He's prone to getting gum infections. So he'll go to the dentist, he'll get the antibiotic and he'll save a few doses for the next time he gets a gum infection. I'm like, no, you gotta, you gotta kill everything. You gotta make sure that everything's gone. Uh, and in theory, that's going to cut down on resistance. Um, like I mentioned before, if we can use antibiotics as little as possible, that would be ideal. Um, However, yeah, there are, you know, a number of infections where it's just obviously like it's the right thing to do to take an antibiotic. Uh, I had a friend on Facebook that, you know, she was waxing on about, I think my kids have strep throat. I'm going to make them gargle with cider, cider vinegar and hopefully that will take care of it. Uh, strep throat is one of those infections that you don't want to mess around with because there are co possible complications from an untreated strep infection. So by all means, get your antibiotic, get rid of the strep throat. Um, there are some infections though, like ear infections, they almost always heal up on their own. So more and more they're trying to, well, let's wait a day or two, let's see if it goes away and not, not take the antibiotic. Um, there's evidence that when kids take uh, lots and lots of rounds of antibiotics when they're young, that that can you know, disrupt their normal microbiota later on when they're adults. There's some evidence that they're more likely to be overweight when they have lots of antibiotics when they're young. Uh, that's a question that hasn't been answered fully or explored fully, but it's sort of interesting to think about. So um, as much as we can limit their use. Um, oftentimes we try to give drugs in combination because sometimes one drug will increase the effectiveness of another. So, you can see two drugs here on a Kirby Bauer test. This zone where um, both the drugs are kind of diffusing together, you've got a larger zone of inhibition there than you do with any of the drugs by themselves. So uh, they might be more effective at killing when you use two drugs together. Now, not all drugs are gonna complement each other. If you've got a drug that keeps a bacteria from growing, uh, along with a drug that has to have growing bacteria in order to kill them, then they're, they actually might be antagonistic rather than synergistic. So you have to understand how they work. But we mentioned the use of clavulonic acid and amoxicillin. Uh, we put those together and we call it augmentin. Okay, so that's a, um, an effort to try to um, 
keep the amoxicillin working by, by blocking those uh, enzymes that some uh, bacteria can make to um, cleave that beta-lactam ring, uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we talked about using the trimethoprim and the sulfonifoxazole together as SXT. Uh, almost always when we're treating, well, whenever we're treating uh, tuberculosis, typically you're given like four drugs at once, all have a different mechanism of, of killing that bacteria. Rifampin, that's the RNA polymerase inhibitor, and isoniazid, that's the one that inhibits the mycolic acid. Uh, those are two common drugs, plus a couple other ones to treat tuberculosis. So, all right. Uh, so if you, if you come at the, the bacteria from a couple of different angles, then it's less likely that the organism will become resistant to both of them at the same time. All right, and we are doing research to try to find drugs. Uh, we're, we're constantly monk monkeying with drugs that we know are already safe. It's a lot cheaper to alter uh, drugs that we know are safe already and make them maybe more effective or less likely for organisms to become resistant. Um, also trying to research uh, what's maybe specific about mycobacterium tuberculosis, for example. Can we find some protein that only that organism has and design a drug for that protein? Okay, so the more specific the drugs are, then hopefully the less likely that, you know, they would have side effects for us and the organism would develop resistance. Okay, so if we think about, we talked about how, well, a bacteria could have some kind of point mutation that might give, us a, give it an advantage and able to survive in the presence of some drug. Uh, that may happen sometimes, but we think more, more often that a bacteria acquires the ability to become resistance, resistant by some kind of horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so remember those three methods of horizontal gene transfer. Uh, we talked about transformation where a bacterial cell can take up DNA from some dead cell. So here the, the cell wall, cell membrane are breaking up and uh, it could, if this cell, what we would say is competent, is able to take up DNA from other cells. Uh, we talked about transduction that involves a bacteriophage kind of accidentally grabbing some of its host's uh, chromosome. And then when that virus infects another cell, uh, and then in, uh, it's a, if it's a lysogenic virus and incorporates some of its DNA into the host, uh, that can change its phenotype there a little bit, maybe carrying some resistance genes. But we think most often uh, a cell might gain uh, antibiotic resistance from conjugation. So especially through conjugation. And remember that involves the pelus extended to the new cell. Uh, the cells are pulled close together, a pore opens up and one cell uh, copies, uh, maybe not just its fertility plasmid, but maybe other plasmids as well that would encode some protein or uh, some instructions for the new cell now to be resistant as well. All right, so if we look at a few specific mechanisms of what that bacterial cell actually can do to make it survive in the presence of that antibiotic. Um, I had a colleague uh, who has since passed away, but he, he used to laugh and say, teaching students about resistance is futile. <laughs> Instead of resistance is futile, teaching them about resistance is futile. Because it's so easy to get mixed up. You have host cells, bacterial cells, and the drug. And it's kind of easy to make, get mixed up, like who's doing what. <laughs> so try to kind of keep that, uh, I guess, straight in your mind. There's just a few paragraphs about this in your book as well that might help. Um, I have numbered my different mechanisms a little bit differently than the book. They list like seven different things and I've kind of grouped some of those things into a same mechanism. So uh, again, check your book here if, if this gets confusing, but. We're talking about ways that bacteria learn to survive. 
All right, so first mechanism is just to limit the, uh, the access of the antibiotic to the bacteria. So the bacteria is doing something either so that the bacteria can't penetrate into the cell or once it's in there to pump it back right back out again. All right, so one thing that gram negatives can do, remember gram negatives have that outer membrane. They have porins in their outer membrane. Now my picture's a little bit small here, but they have these transport channels in that outer membrane called porins. Uh, and sometimes just with maybe a little point mutation in those porins, those transport channels can become more specific uh, and not allow an antibiotic to just transfer uh, right in. Okay, so we're decreasing the membrane permeability, maybe again with just a point mutation or two. Uh, of course, big picture here, the less drug in the cell, the better chance the cell has of surviving the exposure. Uh, cells already have mechanisms to pump toxic things out, or some cells do. Pseudomonas is, is really good at this. Um, so, uh, so pumping out by some kind of active transport using ATP to do that. Um, so some cells are able to just one antibiotic, uh, again, however it gets into the cell, it, it's recognized and pumped right back out again. Uh, and some organisms can do this with lots of different antibiotics, so they can become multi-drug resistant that way. Uh, second mechanism is one that we've talked about already. Okay, uh, enzymatic inactivation of the drug. Okay, so some examples of this, uh, these are enzymes, again, that the bacteria produce like beta-lactamase, okay? If the bacteria uh, gains the ability to make that enzyme, then it can cleave that beta-lactam ring. And now that, that uh, whatever antibiotic is doesn't fit into that active site of transpeptidase and the cell wall uh, can continue to grow. Okay, so it cleaves that beta-lactam ring. And I kind of looked through the literature to try to find some other examples of enzymes there. Um, I won't name them particularly, but I found in this review article of science uh, that there can be enzymes that would just maybe not, not cutting a part of the structure of the drug, but just some slight modifications, adding some kind of functional group uh, can change it so the drug can't bind where it's supposed to. So here's an example. Uh, gentamicin is an amino glycoside. Uh, you can kind of see from the structure here, the, these the sugars, amino modified glycosidic sugar. Uh, it's got a few amino groups on here. So there's enzymes that can alter those amino groups. Sometimes just adding a phosphate like to a hydroxyl group here or there, again, can change it so the drug can't bind where it's supposed to. So it's basically worthless and not gonna harm the bacteria at all. And the third way, sorry, sometimes my slides get a little jumbled up when I put them into their new format. Um, the third mechanism, modification or protection of the target cell structure. So sometimes a cell can modify whatever the target of the antibiotic is so that the antibiotic can't bind to it anymore uh, without harming the functionality of whatever that thing is. So uh, for example, ribosomal RNA methylation. Uh, a bacteria could have enzymes, they're called methyltransferase enzymes that add methyl groups to ribosomal RNA where that drug, say it's an amino glycoside, would bind to it, say in a small subunit, uh, and keep that ribosome from translating proteins. But if the cell can add some methyl groups, then perhaps that drug doesn't uh, recognize that site as well and doesn't bind as well. Uh, and that, again, uh, doesn't uh, alter the functionality of the ribosome. Uh, 
So again, just keeps uh, the drug from interacting with the ribosome. So it just can't bind properly. Okay. And they have found instances where organisms have the ability to, you know, maybe, they, maybe they've gotten just some kind of point mutation uh, in uh, the binding site. So that, so here's two examples. Remember quinolones target DNA gyrase. Organisms have just a small mutation that maybe causes a couple of you know, amino acids difference in that enzyme. And then the drug doesn't bind if it's in the right spot. Okay, same thing with rifampin. Uh, a couple of amino acid differences maybe in that RNA polymerase and the enzyme still functions, but again, the drug just can't bind. Yeah, question. So with, with adding like the methyl groups, how does that not like impact polymerase? Right. So the question is if you add a methyl group, why wouldn't that impact the function? Uh, you would think maybe it would, but just a slight change here or there apparently doesn't always. Yeah. Okay. And the fourth mechanism is maybe not a, a real mechanism. Um, a lot of cells uh, have the ability to kind of uh, live in what we call a persister state. So basically the microbes are kind of dormant. Usually this would happen if you get a biofilm. So a big conglomeration of lots of bacteria, uh, not necessarily the same species, but they could be the same species all kind of living together and just kind of, you know, their metabolism goes way down and they're just persisting. They're kind of dormant, they're still alive, but they're very difficult to kill when they're not really actively metabolizing. So when organisms are in a biofilm like that, uh, sometimes biofilms form on implants, uh, like a knee or a hip or something like that. Uh, oftentimes the, the operation has to be done again and that implant taken out and a new one put in because it's so hard to kill organisms once they form a bio, biofilm. So um, we don't really understand what makes them do this switch into a metabolically more dormant form, but I found this really interesting article that uh, I'll let you look up on your own sometime. It's not, it's kind of written for uh, people that don't know a lot about science, but um, this uh, research that came out of MIT a couple of years ago, well, what do you do if you're trying to get bacteria out of a dormant state? Well, you give them uh, some nutrients that seem, you know, really attractive to them to try to kind of jumpstart their growth. You know, if you've got a kid that's sick and doesn't want to eat, you don't give them spinach, you give them a popsicle, right, to get them to eat something. So, uh, they tried to figure out, well, what's a popsicle that we could give for bacteria cells? Um, they found just giving them a good supply of glucose wasn't enough. They had to also provide some kind of suitable electron acceptor. Oxygen didn't work. They found some organic electron acceptors, uh, plus glucose were able to really jumpstart the metabolism. And once you got them out of this persistent state, they were a lot easier to kill. Okay, so actively growing cells are just always easier to kill. So that uh, was just sort of interesting. All right. Uh, so um, I, I came upon this little exercise. So we're going to take just a minute to do this. Okay. So I've listed some mechanisms here. And the diagram has just kind of graphically tried to um, illustrate those. So take a minute. Uh, and try to figure this, the yellow, like this, this signifies the drug. Okay, the, the yellow circle with the pink line around it, that's, that's the drug. So uh, in number one, well, the bacterial cell is keeping the drug from coming in. So what's another way to say that? So take a minute and see if you can match up the numbers with their mechanism here. I'll give you a minute or two to work on that. 
Sounds like we got some basketball playing again out there. We'll complain about it. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, let's see how you did. So let's see. Um, I'll go with this way. Efflux pump, that would be number three here, pumping out the antibiotic. Uh, number one is decreasing membrane permeability. Uh, let's see, number two here is normally the drug uh, is allowed in, but if you change uh, the porin structure, so that's number two, it's not allowed in. Here, the antibiotic has been altered a little bit. It's, it's different here. So uh, that's number four, modify the drug. And here the binding site has been altered so that the drug can't bind, okay? So I don't know, hopefully that might help you kind of keep those different mechanisms a little bit straight in your mind. All right, questions. Uh, I just had a, a couple other comments. You know, we talked a little bit about bacteriophage and right bacteriophage uh, work on bacterial cells. They're very specific. So what about using bacteriophage instead of antibiotics? So if we had a bacteriophage that was specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, wouldn't that be even better than using antibiotics? Um, probably it would. We, we knew about bacteriophages, uh, you know, early 1900s, but we kind of a lot of research on them stopped when antibiotics came out. We thought that was going to be the end all be all. Um, so it's, it's interesting. We might uh, come to rely a little bit more on bacteriophage. Uh, anybody read the book Aerosmith? Uh, that's one, put it on your list of books to read. That's about a doctor, uh, how he became a doctor in the early 1900s. Uh, this was written in 1925 by Sinclair Lewis. And the, the whole plot of the story was that he uh, was trying to use bacteriophage to cure bubonic plague. So that was in 1925, that whole plot. So it's kind of kind of a cool story when you get the chance. Okay. All right. So, all right, moving forward. So, uh, we're going to talk about the process of infection. And I'm, I'm thinking we should be able to get through this chapter this week. Yeah, so this will be included on Tuesday's exam. Of course, very appropriate to living in a pandemic thinking about how organisms infect us. Uh, next, after, after this chapter, we're gonna be thinking about how our body tries to keep uh, pathogens from, from infecting us. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time on immunology. All right, so uh, we'll think first uh, about no our normal microbiota. Uh, we're gonna be mentioning them uh, several times uh, coming up here, the, the impact that they have. Uh, we've got some terminology we have to discuss, and then we'll get into portals of entry, how microbes gain access to our body, um, and then how they attach and uh, how they invade further in our body tissues. Uh, they have virulence factors that help them to do that. Um, a little bit, we're not going to spend much time here on how our body responds. That's pretty much our immunology section, but we're going to kind of describe different stages of an infection a little bit. And then those pathogens have to have a way to, to exit the host so that they can invade other uh, hosts. And we'll talk about uh, how they are transmitted to other hosts and get into a little touch of epidemiology, some terms there as well. Okay, so hopefully, again, interesting to what we're, we're going through right now. All right, we, we understand now that our normal microbiota is essential uh, to our health. Uh, it seems odd that we have all these bacteria uh, living in us, but um, they're actually, again, helping us and in most cases not harming us. Um, I will be using a lot of different examples of different pathogens in this chapter. Uh, they're just examples to illustrate some principle. So it's the principle that I want you to know. 
you don't, if I talk about measles, for example, you don't have to know everything about measles. Um, it's just, just an illustration. Okay. So first, I think it's important to understand what kind of organisms are part of our normal microbiota. It's not just bacteria. Okay, certainly bacteria. Uh, we also, most of us have some fungi as part of our normal flora, flora maybe even some protozoa, um, and probably some archaea as well. All right, so um, it's kind of interesting to think about that we have so many different organisms. Uh, sometimes I slip and call it normal flora. Uh, flora is a term that kind of, uh, it's kind of gone out of fashion in terms of describing bacteria because flora really makes it sound like it's plants, you know, fauna, animals, flora, plants. So we try to use the term microbiota or microbiome rather than normal flora. But these are our, our microbes that, again, live with us, probably aren't hurting us. Um, we could describe their relationship with us as synergistic, probably. Remember, we talked about symbiotic or synergistic or parasitic. Uh, so some kind of synergism, if we kind of split hairs a little bit more, we could consider them either mutualistic or commensalistic. Uh, a mutualistic relationship is when both organisms are benefited. So we can think of lots of examples of that. Uh, the E. coli in our large intestine. Obviously, we provide a nice, warm, nutrient-rich space for the E. coli. In return, they make some vitamins for us, help us digest our food, uh, help uh, produce folic acid for us. So we know that that's a mutualistic relationship. Um, some relationships with our normal flora are considered commensalistic, and that just means that one member benefits Uh, and the other is not impacted. It's always a little bit difficult to tell though, well, who's impacted how. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of the organisms that live on our skin, we used to consider them commensals because obviously we provide nutrients and they're just there, they're not hurting us, but uh, they didn't seem to be helping us, but now the feeling is that they probably help outcompete other organisms that might be more likely to cause us disease. So, in fact, they are helping us this way. So, sometimes it's not always clear who's helping, who's getting benefit. All right, we could either describe them uh, as transients. So, we know that we have some of our bacteria that kind of come and go. They might be... Uh, associated with say our upper respiratory tract, you know, in our nose for a while. And then for whatever reason, they kind of fall away. Um, we, we know definitely if, if our normal microbiota is, are considered residents, we know definitely that there's a lot of organisms that we acquire soon after birth and we have them for our whole life. Um, and what kinds of the variety of organisms that one person has, we know there can be a good bit of variability between other people. Uh, but that's a really exciting area of research right now, actually, um, trying to understand those interactions and what, what bacteria would be present to make you more healthy? Which ones should we get rid of to make you more healthy? Uh, the table in your book here, I, I don't, I think this was only part of it that I put up here, but this is not for you to memorize, just to kind of giving you an idea of the kinds of organisms that we might find in certain parts of our body. Um, here's an example here. There's a, a fungus, candida, uh, mostly bacteria, but here's a few examples of uh, fungi and a protozoa here in case you're interested. Uh, different kinds of bacteria in different parts of our body. Of course, the large intestine, uh, not really any oxygen there. So those organisms are more likely to be anaerobes where an organism in your nose, obviously is gonna be more likely to be aerobic. There are certain areas of our body that we think are azenic, uh, meaning that there aren't any 
microbes there, no normal flora. So the alveoli of our lungs, uh, considered azenic, uh, a lot of our internal organisms, central nervous system, blood, lymph. Uh, at least for now, we think we haven't detected any uh, normal microbiota there. Okay. Uh, let's get straight on a few terms before we go any further, and we're going to revisit the normal microbiota shortly here. Okay. Those terms infection and disease are often used kind of interchangeably, uh, but if we use them correctly, we have an infection, a bacterial infection, for example. That means that that bacteria has entered, established itself, and multiplied within a host. So really, our normal microbiota could be considered an infection. Um, why our immune system doesn't eradicate that is, is kind of a mystery. <laughs> we know that it kind of probably our bacteria that are normally there are probably kind of helping keep our immune system primed a little bit. Uh, so you can have an infection and not actually have any harm to the host. If you have harm to the host, that's described as disease. All right, so theoretically you can have an infection without actually having disease. Uh, Let's see. Oh, and then a pathogen. Sometimes we would say a true pathogen uh, is a virus or a bacteria that causes disease in a healthy host with normal Im immune defenses. Okay, so salmonella, for example, uh, you ingest some salmonella, you're healthy. It doesn't matter how healthy you are, you're probably going to get some salmonella food poisoning. <laughs> okay, you're going to have some diarrhea, maybe some throwing up. Uh, you'll probably be miserable. Okay, that's a true pathogen. There's other organisms that might only make you sick in certain circumstances, and we call those um, opportunistic pathogens. Okay. Oh. Just realized that some of my turns got cut off here. Okay, so uh, an opportunistic pathogen is one that, you know, if only the right circumstances arise, uh, the host's immune system is low, for example, or, you know, because of maybe some drugs they're on, or um, we'll explore what makes, what can make a, an opportunistic pathogen successful in, in causing an infection. Okay, so I didn't realize a couple of my words got cut off here. Um, the difference between pathogenicity and uh, virulence. Um, I didn't think I was planning on writing anything in there, so that's okay that that got, got cut off. Um, but those are two terms that are often kind of used interchangeably. Um, if we use these in the correct sense, um, pathogenicity is the capacity of a microbe to cause disease. So usually we, we say, well, is that organism pathogenic, pathogenic or is it not? It's actually not correct to say, oh, it's really pathogenic. <laughs> Sometimes we say that, uh, but it's more correct to say uh, for an organism that's more likely to cause disease, uh, it's, it's more correct to say that organism is high in virulence, okay? Virulence then is uh, the, the measure of a disease causing ability. Uh, okay, so you could have a pathogen that's highly virulent. That means it's really likely to cause an infection and uh, implies that the infection is going to be severe. Uh, and that's a little bit different than the way your book defines this. Um, I've looked that up in lots of different sources and uh, a highly virulent organism is uh, defined by the case fatality ratio. Okay, so that implies that uh, a, a really severe infection, uh, a severe disease uh, is caused by a highly virulent organism. Yeah. So it can be any pathogen like that. 
Right, so any pathogen, viruses and bacteria are considered pathogens. Uh, protozoa are considered parasites. So it, it, just a little difference in the terminology used there. Uh, okay, so again, that's a little bit different the way your book defines that, but, but usually highly virulent is gonna be a, um, a more severe disease Okay, and then totally dropped off my uh, last one, uh, virulence factors. Okay, those are the tools that an organism has to cause disease and to cause damage in the host or just establish an infection, basically. Okay, so we're going to talk about lots of examples of different virulence factors. So revisiting our normal microbiota for a minute. Um, if you have, right, we have a huge variety of, you know, different kinds of organisms in our body. Sometimes one of those organisms that usually is not gonna cause you any harm uh, can suddenly cause disease. So how might that come about? Well, if one of those organisms gets introduced into a part of your body that it's not normally in, then that can certainly cause disease. The uh, best example I can think of is, of course, you have millions of bacteria in your large intestine. If that large intestine gets perforated, so you have, if you have like a severe intestinal disease causes a perforated bowel or say a stab wound to the large intestine or an appendix burst, Suddenly you have bacteria that nor normally were enclosed in that large intestine outside of the large intestine. I don't know what you call that body cavity. Uh, my anatomy is not good. Um, but uh, now they can be getting into the bloodstream and places where they're really going to cause a huge problem. Okay, uh, you know, same thing. Organisms that are typically on your skin, you know, you puncture, you get a wound on your skin and now they can be spreading to other parts of the body and causing uh, disease. Uh, if the host becomes immune suppressed, uh, then uh, more likely that's going to cause some kind of pathogen from outside to cause a foothold, but it's possible that that, that, that again could, could make some bacteria that's already into your, in your body. Um, we can transiently carry um, the, the bacteria that causes whooping cough in, in our nose. And you know, if for some reason you go on some drug that's immunosuppressive, then it's possible that, that you could get whooping cough where normally you wouldn't. Okay, so what kind of things could suppress our immune system? Uh, age, uh, extreme age usually. As, our, as we age, our immune system wanes. Okay, so my 100-year-old grandpa, he's a lot more susceptible to a lot of things than, than what I would be. Uh, certainly genetic defects uh, can, can cause uh, you to be immune suppressed. Um, maybe you have an inability to make a certain kind of antibody or uh, all sorts of things there. Certainly immunosuppressive drugs. So uh, like I have a friend that's on prednisone for arthritis, okay? It's a steroid that dampens down her immune system. Uh, here's a big one, physical or mental stress. Okay. It include in there lack of sleep. Okay, that's gonna lower your immune system. Sometimes if you get one infection, then it certainly can um, actually dampen your immune system a little bit and make you more susceptible to getting another. If you're not eating right, uh, nutrition, malnutrition, that, that can be another thing. So that's just some examples of ways that our immune system can be dampened and we could be, um, again, more susceptible to some opportunistic pathogen.
Uh, and certainly changes in the normal microbiota from going on antibiotics. So we kind of mentioned this, I think maybe last lecture or the lecture before, but if you go on some strong antibiotic that takes out a lot of your normal flora, then normal microbiota, then uh, maybe some candida that you would normally have in small numbers will start to overgrow. Uh, you could get a vaginal yeast infection, uh, thrush is the other thing, the overgrowth in your mouth, uh, and Clostridium difficile, C. diff, that's uh, bad diarrhea. All right. All right, so let's think about some factors that can make an organism more likely or less likely to be infective. All right, so uh, we're gonna look at these one at a time, but there certainly is variety in different organisms as to how likely they are to infect a host. It has to do with what virulence factors they have. Uh, it has to do with how much the host is uh, exposed. Okay, so the numbers of organism that the host is exposed to. Uh, and also, again, the strength of the host defenses. Uh, and I, and I, I plopped this picture in here because um, probably most of you didn't do this this semester in lab, but I had my students go around and swab surfaces uh, around Henry Hall, streak them on a plate, and just see what grew up there. Um, you know, for example, the door handle going into the room, you know, somebody had a plate that was just covered in all sorts of things just from the door handle. Uh, and sometimes that really grosses people out. Uh, you know, they want to be using hand sanitizer every five minutes, which, you know, in our climate that we're in right now, maybe is not a bad idea. Um, but um, it really sometimes, again, makes people worry a lot. Um, and I always tell them, think of these three things, okay? These organisms that are growing up, say, from your shoe or the countertop or whatever, they're organisms that you've been around your whole life, and so they're not likely to be harming you. Um, we are growing them up here in a lot larger number than what they would be on your countertop at home. If you've got colonies growing on your countertop at home, yes, it's time to get the bleach out. It's time to clean a little bit, <laughs> okay? But otherwise, you know, just doing it every once in a while is fine. Uh, and if you're generally healthy, then that's in your favor as well. So I always try to get students not to worry about that too much. And sometimes students ask me, oh, are you always cleaning at home because you know about all this stuff? And not really. <laughs> I just exposure to a wide variety of microbes is good for your immune system. I am careful about anything that's been fecally contaminated. So, you know, a, a diaper or whatever, or, a, you know, a toilet overflow. I clean that really good. I'm really careful with raw meat. Otherwise, you know, I'll drop something on the floor, I'll probably eat it again. Um, but that's part of personality too. Okay, so looking at, thinking about the type of organisms. So this chart just gives some examples of the, some organisms that are considered really virulent. Again, these are just examples. Um, and some organisms that are much less virulent. So a virulent organism, if a, a healthy person that's exposed to it is almost always gonna get sick, <laughs> okay? Where uh, a less virulent organism probably would never make us sick. Um, this, this infection, uh, fran uh, rabbit fever, or tularemia, um, it's, it's kind of rare, but that's a potentially deadly infection when it gets in the pneumatic form. So you can actually um, breathe this in if you're around fleas that live on rabbits. So if you're a rabbit hunter, they say don't hunt rabbits in months that don't have an R in them. So May, June, and July, and August. Don't hunt rabbits then because rabbits have more fleas then and you're more likely to be exposed to this. Uh, bubonic plague, another organism, Yersinia pestis, that's, that's highly virulent because, again, it can go into pneumatic form and uh, you breathing it in, you're more likely uh, to die, basically, when it gets in that form. 
uh, less virulence, uh, the whooping cough. Like I said, some of us can have that transiently as normal flora, but that's why you should have a, a whooping cough vaccine if you're around babies, because uh, it's babies that are really susceptible to that. If we get sick with it, it's, it's likely to make us miserable for a while, but babies can potentially die from that. Uh, and again, you can be a carrier and not know it. Uh, here's some organisms that are, would be considered opportunists. So most they're not normally going to make you sick, but uh, especially burn patients where they've lost sort of their first line of defense, their skin, they're really susceptible to pseudomonas infections. We talked about C. diff, uh, the candida, it's a vaginal infection. So those are all considered opportunists. Uh, and these organisms wouldn't ever make us sick. So the lactobacilli that's found in yogurt, you probably eat those all the time. Diphtheroides, that's a kind of kerny bacterium that's on our skin. Hurt us, we think, at all. And, and the colors here, I think they just made these pink because they're gram negatives. Um, these are gram positives down here. The fungi is not either gram positive or gram negative. And this is what the C. diff looked like kind of when we spore stain them. So I think that's what the, those are. Okay. So again, there's differences in different organisms as to how likely they are to cause an infection. Uh, differences in infectious dose. So some organisms, you can get sick from one cell. Other organisms, it might take millions of cells to cause uh, an infection. So there's just differences there again, depending on what virulence factors they have. But we express this in terms of ID, infectious dose. Um, sometimes we call it the ID50, that's the infectious dose where about, you know, an average or 50% of test animals would, would get sick. Sometimes we don't know the infectious dose because it's not ethical to infect a person and we don't have a good animal model to try to determine that. Uh, but again, it varies. This Q fever is kind of a, kind of a flu-like infection. It's not really serious. Cholera, a billion cells. Um, and oftentimes, uh, the more cells, with some infections, you know, the more you're exposed to it, obviously, the more likely you are to get sick. Uh, I read a really interesting case study, and I didn't, I forget where I read it, but it was uh, describing a foodborne outbreak uh, in a restaurant and how they figured out, oh, it was, it was something in the garlic bread that caused lots of people to get sick, which is kind of unusual. But there was one guy that somehow they determined he'd eaten 24 pieces of garlic bread. He was really, really sick. And people that had just eaten a slice or two were only had mild symptoms. So that infectious dose can be important, certainly, as to how sick you become. Uh, and I just thought I would throw this up here. Uh, this is a infection that's highly virulent because we think it only takes a few virus particles to make someone sick. Okay, you probably have never seen anybody with this infection, but it's a measles rash. Okay, one of the most virulent pathogens that we, that we know of, one person with measles if, uh, is likely to give it to about 12 to 15 other people. It's called the reproductive rate. So highly infectious. Um, if you walk into an elevator, where somebody was in an hour ago that had measles and you're susceptible, you're not vaccinated, then you're likely to get measles. So it's just really infectious. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I noted here, note here that one of the authors here, uh, Anthony Fauci, kind of famous lately. He's, he's uh, been instrumental in a number of text, textbooks. Okay, and then lastly, uh, so we talked about the, the kind of organism that it is and infectious dose. Uh, again, the host defenses. So these are the, some of the same things that we talked about that can make an opportunist become uh, more, more of a pathogen. Uh, the age of the host, right? really young babies are very susceptible to a lot of things that we as adults wouldn't be. And then again, our immunity wanes again as we get older. Uh, you know, not eating well, um, genetic or acquired defects in immunity, stress. Uh, it's well known that you produce corticosteroids when you're 
under stress and steroids weaken the immune system. So um, I know we're getting to a stressful time this semester, so take care of yourselves. Uh, any kind of drugs that you might be on, cancer, chemotherapy, organ transplant, those are all things that are known to weaken immunity. All right, so let's start uh, here as we, well, as we finish up today, thinking about that process when organisms come in contact with the host, they first have to find the correct portal of entry. So they're usually pretty specific. For instance, if you swallow HIV or you inhale HIV, you are not gonna get AIDS, okay? It has, usually they're very specific portals of entry, uh, specific sites, specific cells that those pathogens can attach to. Uh, so um, we get a wide variety there. Uh, so looking at these, we're talking about exogenous pathogens. So those are pathogens that come from outside of the body and find their way uh, into establishing an infection inside our body. So we're not talking about, you know, pathogens that were there, that were opportunists and then become pathogenic. Skin is not a very good portal of entry. Um, I don't think I posted this because we're going to kind of come back to how good the skin is at uh, protecting us when we get into our immunology. Uh, but uh, really the only way that a pathogen can penetrate the skin is, is through a hair follicle or a sweat gland. And we have some you know, antimicrobial chemicals that we make that make that happen not very often. Um, the top few layers of the skin are dead. And those dead cells are continuously sloughing off. We call that process desquamation. Okay, so uh, let's make a note of that. I didn't give myself much room here, but top layers of cells uh, are dead. Okay, so pathogens, they have to be able to attach to the cells. That's the next step that we're talking about in order to cause an infection. And basically they can't attach because the, the skin cells keep falling off, okay? The, the most common portal of entry is going to be mucous membranes. Uh, it's a thinner layer of cells. It's easier to penetrate. So uh, those are most common ones. So any lining of the body cavity basically is gonna have a mucous membrane, uh, your eyes, reproductive tract. Uh, any idea what the most common of those uh, mucous membranes is for a pathogen to be able to breach? Any guesses? Uh, respiratory tract. That's going to be the number one portal of entry. So, of course, that's what coronavirus uh, takes advantage of. Uh, the GI tract would probably be the second one, but that stomach acidity is really good at... Uh, really cutting down on a lot of pathogens. Of course, any foodborne thing would be able to survive that pretty well. Okay, we will finish up with portals of entry next time and hopefully get through the rest of the chapter. Uh, hopefully you have a good day. Um, office hours now for a couple hours. You need to see me.